So if you if you attended, it sounds like from what I've heard about um, this series, if you attended this last year, probably a lot of the talks were were focused on various aspects of computational biology and computer science. And I think we're probably maybe broadening that sort of theme a little bit today. Um, we're really thinking about sort of um, how can technology provide novel opportunities for solving you know sort of big big issues in biodiversity science. And so that's sort of the theme today. And, and we're going to be talking about um, uh, particularly this, this focus on citizen science. And I'll describe that in a few minutes. But what I, what I want to start with is a bit more sort of broadly thinking about what are some of the big challenges that we face in, um, what are some of the big challenges that we face when, we, when we're thinking about sort of biodiversity, um, particularly you know, moving forward over the next few decades. Right, there we go. So this is a, this is a slide that I think really, um, really sort of showcases the, the sort of situation that we have today. So this is a, this is a slide um, basically looking at, at light distribution uh, across, the, across the globe. And, right, and, what, and there's sort of two facts that go along with this. One of those facts is that the current uh, population, the human population on Earth, is 7.4 billion people. And just by comparison, because we're going to use this number 1970 a little bit today, just by comparison, um, you know, just in 1970 we were half that, right? We were at about 3.7 billion. And the other thing that, that is really amazing, I mean, for the first time in the history of our species, this happened in 2009, there's more people living in cities than are living in rural areas. Um, so at the present, it's about 54% of, of humans live in urban areas. Um, and that number is expected to continue to grow fairly rapidly. And by 2050, we're looking at 66% of people living in urban areas. And so as we think about the major threats to biodiversity that we're sort of dealing with right now. I mean, some of the obvious ones are just the you know, massive amount of, of human population growth and the associated um, habitat changes that have come along with that, all the habitat modification that comes along with that. Um, you know, but another big sort of related issue is this, is this issue of urbanization. And of course, with all these people, we're also thinking about other things like global climate change. But if you're thinking about global climate change, or you're thinking about issues of urbanization, you know, what you really need to do to understand how species are responding to that is you need to have some understanding of where things occurred in the past and some understanding of where things occurred today. And you can use that information to then make some predictions about how organisms are responding to these changes, whether those be issues associated with global climate change or whether those be issues associated with, with maybe something that's, that's maybe even more measurable, something like urbanization. Um, and what I want to show you is, is actually how, is it sort of how, what, what a horrible situation we are currently in for, for dealing with you know, just the basic raw data for doing these kinds of analyses, which is, which is why my talk was titled um, you know, something about solving the urban biodiversity data crisis. It's this lack of data. So this is a very up-to-date table because I made it uh, like an hour ago in Lyndon's office. Um, this is a table. So, so I realize that a lot of folks here may not, may not be, you know, maybe their background is in, is in computational stuff and not necessarily in, in sort of conservation biology. But, if you're a conservation biologist, like our currency, the raw data we most often work with is basically um, a voucher specimen, like at a museum, for example, the museum here, the Museum of Natural Sciences here. So a voucher specimen that documents where a particular species occurred at a given place at a given time in the past. So we have these vouchers. And we use those, we use those locality records as ways to just understand you know, basic distributional data. And what this graph is just showing you is for the state of Louisiana, I basically went to this database called VertNet and I pulled down from something like 258 collections around the globe. I pulled down every record of a reptile or amphibian collected in the state of Louisiana and put into a natural history museum for these various decades. And so what you can see, not surprisingly, is that you know in the 1900s there wasn't a huge number of specimens collected for that decade. You know, 200 specimens for the whole state of Louisiana. And not surprisingly, those numbers get bigger through time. You know, human population is going up. The, the number of universities in the state is going up. The number of professional herpetologists is going up. And, and this is what we see quite commonly, is that you get to like the 1950s, 60s, and, and 70s when we see the highest numbers. But this is still for the entire state of Louisiana. You're getting something like, you know, 3,264 reptile and amphibian specimens collected for the entire state for that decade. But then what you see is this really dramatic drop, right? 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, you're getting a small number of specimens. You know, this, again, this is for the entire state. So if you want to ask like a really basic question, pick whatever species you're thinking about that you know is a conservation concern here in the state. And you want to ask a really basic question. Well, 
you know, is, is it really declining? Where does it occur now? Where did it occur 50 years ago? You have so little data to be able to do that, to be able to answer these most basic sort of conservation and natural history questions. And so this is sort of our, our urban, uh, our, our biodiversity data crisis. It's true whether you're thinking about urban areas. Unfortunately, it's true whether you're thinking about um, pretty much anywhere. Um, it's particularly bad in urban areas, and I'll show you some slides to, to that effect in just a minute. But that's sort of the issue here. And that's sort of an issue that really motivates a lot of my work, is can we get around this problem of not having enough data to understand the modern distributions of organisms and how those distributions have shifted through time. And a lot of my research is motivated by this idea um, of biodiversity hotspots. So that phrase, biodiversity hotspots, is a phrase that you hear thrown around in conservation biology all the time. And usually it's thrown around without people actually recognizing that there actually is a very explicit definition. Um, and that definition are these two things here. Biodiversity hotspots are places, this is defined by Conservation International, it's been in the literature about 20 years. There are places that have incredibly high endemicity. That just means that there's a lot of species that occur there in that place and nowhere else in the world. That's what endemicity means. So we're looking at at least 1,500 um, endemic vascular plants. It's just a high rate of endemicity. We count vascular plants just because plants don't move and they're a whole heck of a lot easier to count than things that are moving. Um, and that for that area where there's this incredible biodiversity, this incredibly high endemicity, there's also really high threat. And the threat is defined as at least 70% of the original habitat has been lost. And if we look around the globe at the places that have that incredible biodiversity and that really high threat, there's 35 of them. Um, and they're like, it's, it's, it's basically a who's who of National Geographic cover articles, right? Or, uh, cover uh, issues. So it's, you know, New Zealand, it's, um, you know, Southeast Asia and the Philippines, it's Madagascar, it's, um, you know, Atlantic Forest of Brazil, it's the Caribbean. Um, and the area that I'm going to jump to is one that maybe people don't think of right away. It's this area called the California Floristic Province. It's the only biodiversity hotspot. It's basically the only biodiversity hotspot that we have um, in the United States. This is just, if you jump in a little bit closer, this is what it looks like. So it's basically most of California, excluding the desert, gets up a little bit into Oregon, gets up into a little, or down into a little bit of Baja, California. Um, so what are the threats here? So um, for anybody who has spent very much time in California, you know that um, you know, this area that I'm sort of encircling right now, that's the Central Valley. That's entirely been plowed and turned into agricultural fields. Um, the other big threat is urbanization. And if we're thinking about the threat of urbanization, we're jumping right down to LA. So we're jumping right down to this area here where there's just a huge number of people. And I just want to show you a graph of population growth in the greater LA area. So if I gave you a map and said, like, like draw a line around LA, I like gave you like a Google, uh, a Google map image of LA, the greater LA area is that gray region of urbanization that you would all encircle. So it covers, a, a portion, covers portions of five counties. And in 1900, the population of um, the greater LA area was about uh, a quarter million people. Uh, at the present time, it's 18.55 million people. So it's been this absolutely phenomenal rate of growth. But that number, 18.55 million, is so big that it's like, what does that really mean? So the way that I like to think about it is I divide it out. Um, it's not supposed to say question mark. It was supposed to be updated. Uh, it's actually supposed to be 159,134. I added another year in there. Um, that's the number of people that have been added to the greater LA area every year for 115 years straight. It's just a phenomenal amount of, of change. I mean, that's like a mid-sized US city being dropped into that region for 115 years straight. Maybe to put it into perspective that makes more sense, that means that the LA area has added one Baton Rouge every, uh, sorry, every 17 months we've added one Baton Rouge. Um, again, for 100, since 1900, we've added one Baton Rouge every, six, every 17 months. So, on top of that, the greater LA area has some really other interesting things going on. So it's part of Southern California. We've got 22.4 million people in Southern California. Uh, we've got the fifth busiest airport in the world in LAX. And um, we also have the busiest container port in the United States with the, the combined port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And so there's just this incredible stuff going on. There's this, you know, we have this amazing biodiversity there. We have this incredibly high level of biodiversity. All these species that occur in the California Floristic Province and nowhere else in the world and we have these massive threats, particularly this incredible level of urbanization. And we also have all these people and goods that are moving in and out of the area. And with those people and those goods, hitching rides in the backs of the station wagons and in the backs of the U-Hauls, 
and coming in on the cargo ships are all sorts of non-native species that are also showing up in the air. So there's a lot going on in this region. So if we do the same graph that we did for Louisiana for the greater LA area, or so in this case Los Angeles County, and we just ask for all reptiles and amphibians, um, what's the information we have from museum specimens, the raw data for these biological um, inventories? And what we see is a very similar sort of uh, very similar situation. So what you look at is you know, 1950s and 60s and 70s, you know, we're jumping up from, you know, originally we're starting fairly low. Actually, this, this looks like a really big number, but it's entirely because of some collections that were done on some uh, offshore islands. But the numbers kind of get up in the 30s and the 40s, and then we're getting four to 6,000 specimens per decade deposited in the museum specimens. So we actually kind of have a decent idea of what's going on just for LA County in this time period. And then you look here, and what you quickly see, right, in the 80s and the 1990s and the first um, decade of this millennium, is that all of a sudden, there's very few specimens. So again, if you want to ask the most basic question, how is Species X responding to this incredible level of urbanization? We can't even address that, because we have so few specimens. I mean, this is, you know, 275 specimens across, I don't know, 100 and some odd species that occur in that region. And we basically... You know, for each individual species, we have so little data, we can't even examine these most basics of natural history and conservation questions. So um, I just sort of said this a few minutes ago, but you know, just as an over overview of the situation, we've got a global biodiversity hotspot. We've got incredible urbanization. We've got non-native species coming in all the time. The biodiversity is changing incredibly rapidly, both because of the loss of native species and, the, and this influx of non-native species. And the data that we have to document this is just horrendously poor. And it's poor for a variety of reasons, but one of the big reasons is that if you think about the greater LA area, what you have is you have tons of private property. You have backyards, you have front yards, all these private residences. If you ask a biologist, how do you go do, you know, you're going to go survey place X. Well, you know, usually it's pretty easy. We have like, you know, a standard set of, of surveys that we like to implement. You go out to your national forest, you go out to, you know, some plot of land and you implement those surveys. But how do you do that when your plot of land is a city block? and there's 20 different private properties on that block. It's really hard to do that kind of work. And so um, when I moved to Los Angeles, I started to wonder, you know, is the solution to this problem of how we get data from these regions, is, is the solution uh, citizen science? So what the heck is citizen science? It's a term that hopefully most of you have heard. Um, this is the definition that I use. This is from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. Um, and it's simply citizen science are projects in which volunteers partner with scientists to answer real world questions. Um, and ideally, those are questions that the scientists are posing um, and, and asking for this help because that's the only way they can get the, the data. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to answer these questions. And so what I'm going to focus on is this project that I created called the Reptiles and Amphibians of Southern California Project. Um, and the acronym is, is RASCALS. Um, so that's what we'll be focusing on today. And I created this project to do two things. One thing, oh, and this is the, if you were, I'll show you in a second what the project looks like, but this is the banner from the project. Um, that you can find online. And we have basically, you know, what are our real world questions that we're trying to address? Well, we have two. So the first one is the one I've been focusing on most of the uh, talk so far is understanding how species have responded to urbanization. The second big goal um, is really one that the project wasn't originally designed for, but we sort of found that it was incredibly good at doing. And so I've been focusing a lot of effort on, on this, which is documenting and tracking um, these introduced species, these non native species. Um, this is what the project page looks like. So this is a citizen science project that's hosted on a platform called iNaturalist, which hosts, I don't know, a couple thousand citizen science projects. And um, this is, I forget, this is maybe from May, I think is when I took this screenshot. And even then, we had about um, 6,300 observations uh, submitted. At this point, the project was about 23 months old. So it's, we all of a sudden had 6,000 observations from Southern California. We had over, um, it's probably hard to see this, but it's 525 members. So we had over 525 people submitting observations um, that they had, that they had basically photographs that they had taken while they were out and about in Southern California. So if we just revisit our, our table here and ask, okay, well, you know, we've got this big problem with so few modern day records that we can compare to historical records. Well, how many records has this citizen science project generated? So again, this project has existed for 27 months. Um, covers all of Southern California, 22.4 million people. Um, remember that, you know, in the previous, uh, in the first, you know, 2000, 2009, we only had 275 vouchered records for um, 
Los Angeles County as like standard museum records. Well, in the first 27 months of Rascals, we got 2,568 photo vouchered records. So basically this is somebody was walking around somewhere in LA County and they saw a lizard, they saw a snake, they saw a frog, they saw a salamander, they saw a turtle, and they just pulled out their smartphone and they took a photo of it and they either emailed that photo to us or they submitted it to iNaturalist. And so we get a photograph that because smartphones are GPS enabled, we get the precise locality and we get a date so we know when that was observed and of course we get a timestamp as well. So we get all the same information that you get from a museum voucher in terms of being a voucher for an animal occurring at a particular place at a particular time. Um, and again, if you just think about these numbers, we've gotten more records in 27 months than we can get from you know, this 30 year period um, in terms of these modern, modern, sort of modern day records. So it's, it's really been sort of this amazing opportunity to collect lots and lots of, of observational data. So I want to just give you, I want to come back and talk about some success stories from these two different real world questions. So again, you know, my main goal is to assess how species have responded to urbanization. I'm just going to show you an example of some of the types of observations that we're getting. And then most of the rest of the talk is going to focus on sort of stories of documenting and tracking introduced species. So here's, here's an observation. Um, this actually came in as part of a, a sort of a preliminary project we did before the real start of the Rascals project, but it gives you an idea of what these look like. So this is a, a thing called the Garden Slender Salamander. For the herpetologists in the audience, it's the Trachoceps major. And this is the, the, the quote that somebody wrote when they posted this. This person, Nick117, when he found this in his backyard in Orange, California. He says, well, my family and I were remodeling our backyard. We were moving rocks around, and we found a salamander under one of the rocks. So the reason that I highlight this is because this is exactly the kind of record that I, as a biologist, can't get. You know, if you want to study the distribution of the Trachoceps major across Southern California, and its entire range is within urbanized areas, the entire range of the species is in urbanized areas. If you wanted to study that, how are you going to get into the thousands of backyards that you need to get into to understand its distribution? You're just not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to go door to door and get the permissions to do that. It's just going to take you your whole life to do that. But now we can get you know, dozens of these observations you know, a year just from you know, this citizen science project. So these are the kinds of records that we're getting. Um, again, you know, because being able to compare these modern day records, and we, we just need thousands of them. So it's going to take us a while to really get to the point where we can do some really fun analyses comparing the modern day records to the historical records. So um, we're still working on all that. But what's been really fun is that we've come across all these situations where we've been able to document um, species that have never been recorded in a county or never been recorded in, that, in, in the state of California before. And because these end up being sort of such interesting finds, you know, these are things that we're able to you know, publish fairly quickly. So what I want to do is I want to focus um, on those a little bit and tell you some stories uh, of some of these species. So this gecko should look really, really familiar. If it doesn't look familiar, before you step into your front door tonight, stop and look up at your porch light and the gecko that's hanging out right there, that's this guy. Um, that's the Mediterranean house gecko. This is a, this is a photograph that was taken by um, a nine-year-old. His name is Reese Bernstein. And again, this was part of this predecessor project called Lost Lizards of Los Angeles, which only focused on lizards and only for LA County. And it was because of, mostly because of this story and the success of this project that we expanded it to the Rascals Project, so all of Southern California and all reptiles and amphibians. So Reese is like really, I mean, he's nine, so he's really passionate about two things in life. He's really passionate about finding lizards and he's really passionate about coin collecting. And if you actually look, that's a 1941S penny, which apparently is like a cool find if you're a nine-year-old into coin collecting. Um, I was much more excited about the gecko, though. So this gecko is a Mediterranean house gecko. And what's exciting about these guys is that um, they have a really interesting history in the US. So it's called the Mediterranean house gecko for a region. A reason it's from the Mediterranean region. Um, but it shows up in Florida, actually, in South Florida in 1910. And it's kind of hanging out mostly in Florida until the 1950s. And post-World War II, Eisenhower starts promoting the interstate highway system. And that starts getting developed. In particular, Highway 10, right? We all are pretty familiar with Highway 10, running across the southern United States. And what these geckos do is they start jumping into suitcases and hitching rides in the back of station wagons and into cardboard boxes and in the backs of U-Hauls and the under pallets and in semi-trucks. And they start jumping from like Super 8 to Motel 6 to highway rest stop to truck stop all across the southern United States. And then ending up in, you know, Baton Rouge and ending up in New Orleans and expanding out from there. And they literally just start colonizing the southern United States. You know, they get to central Texas. 
and it starts to get a lot more arid, and they're like, whatever, don't care. Um, I can hide under a house. I can hide under. I can hide behind a fridge. Yeah, it seems really hot and dry right now, but the sprinklers are going to go off tonight, and it's nice and humid. Life's fine. And they just keep going across Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and they start showing up in California. And again, you guys know these geckos. They just hang out around porch lights. They're eating spiders and insects and stuff that's attracted to the lights. Um, and so, so Reese documents this. You know, he, he's, he's the first photograph of this gecko um, for Southern California. And it turns out that um, they've never been documented before in LA County. And so um, I worked with Reese and his dad. And in whatever that says, September 2013, um, Reese, who at this point was 12 and in the seventh grade, um, was published in the peer reviewed literature in this journal called Herpetological Review. Um, which mostly just points out about how lazy all the rest of us are because Reese, as a seventh grader, was published in the scientific literature. Um, that's a picture of Reese. We actually have an exhibit uh, at the museum called the Nature Lab, which focuses on, on urban biodiversity um, in Southern California. And so we actually tell the story of Reese's discovery um, of this Mediterranean house gecko. So that's him in front of his exhibit. Um, and that's the issue of herpetological review in the background. Um, I would love, like as a conservation biologist, I would love to be able to tell you that this is like a one-time story. And, you know, it was great. Reese is like a cute kid. It's a success. He got published. Yay. Um, and I'd love to have it in there because if it doesn't end there, what it means is that there's lots more things that are showing up and the story is happening over and over and over. But that's the reality. So this is a photograph that I received um, April 15th, uh, 2013. And this was a picture that was taken by this guy, Glenn Yoshida. Glenn was walking into his house and he saw this gecko and he took a picture of it and he emailed it in and I had no clue what it was. I knew it wasn't the Mediterranean house gecko. Um, I was pretty sure it was one of two species, but to tell these two species apart, you basically need to flip them over and look at the number of, basically the, the technical term for it is um, how far do the lamellae on the fourth toe go down onto the palm? Okay, that's not something you see from a photograph. Um, that's something you catch the gecko, you flip it over, and you pull out a, a hand lens, and you figure it out. Um, so I wasn't able to tell from this photo which species it was. There's one other character that kind of worked, but I knew it was one of two species. And I said, either one of those species has never been reported as an established population in the state. Again, this was the 15th of April. So um, on the 17th of April, I showed up at Glenn's house, and he and I donned our headlamps, and we wandered around his neighborhood looking for more geckos. Um, and this is what we found. So. The first thing we found was not a gecko, but this is the um, this this image right here. This is the side gate at Glenn's house. That's his downspout, and you open his side gate. And I looked in this little tiny. It's like you know less than a centimeter wide. And here is a hatched gecko egg. These geckos basically just take their eggs and they kind of glue them to any sort of little hidden away place somewhere and leave them there. And you know, like six weeks later, a gecko hatches out. And so that's what that is right there. We did find a gecko. Um, here's the gecko. I was able to hold it in my hands. And I was able to tell that that's a thing called the Indo-Pacific gecko, which I think is also known for the state of Louisiana. Um, there's at least one population in the state. Um, so this was not only the first record for LA County. This is actually the first record for the state of California. And we know from Glenn that it's been established since at least 2011. So here we have. You know, another case of a non-native species being documented entirely because of the help of a citizen scientist. Um, a few months later, it happens again. 6th of June, this guy named Bob Worrell, who lives in um, Orange County, a place called Lake Forest in Orange County, sends me another photo. Now, Glenn's actually, uh, he's a retired guy, but he's, at this point, he's basically a professional photographer. And he takes another photo of these geckos. And just from these, these photos, I was able to tell what it was. So this is, again, an Indo-Pacific gecko. And I should have mentioned, these are, it's a really interesting species. They're, they're great colonizers. They are, it's an entirely asexual species. Every photo I've shown you is a female. It's easy to tell the sex because they're all females. Um, these big white blobs you see right there, those are eggs. So these females are just all, all breeding season long. They're just, they're just yoking up, an egg, yoking up a, uh, two eggs, actually. They lay their two eggs, and they start you know, developing up two new eggs, and then, and then lay those. So I've been down to, to Bob's uh, house as well. This is the first record for that county. Uh, again, they've been established there since at least 2009. Um, just to, to sort of expedite all of these stories, I can just tell you, um, here's a list of them. So the Mediterranean gecko, uh, we now know that that species, we've, got, we've picked up the first records for LA, Orange, and Ventura County. Every single one of these is the result of a citizen scientist, somebody who took a photograph and submitted it 
um, either by email or directly to one of these projects. Indo-Pacific Gecko, we have the first record for the state of California. It's now in two counties. Um, the green anole, that's the lizard that like half of you in this room saw today. Right? That's the one that hangs out on vegetation all across campus. And the males have that, that red dew lap that they display. So we'd have those in the not but the closest they should get to California is Central Texas, but we have those in LA County now as well. Again, documented by a citizen scientist. And we have these little tiny snakes. Jen and Kathy, you guys have them here too, right? Brownie blind snakes? They're probably here. Um, they look like earthworms. Uh, this is actually the most widespread um, uh, non-sea snake in the world. And it's entirely because it gets spread around in soil. So it's also called the flower pot snake. And so these snakes are just like hanging out mostly through the nursery trade. They're being moved all over the place, uh, mostly in tropical plants. So we have those all over Southern California now. And a bunch of these records are from these citizen science records. And what we do is, because these citizen scientists are so crucial in helping us make these discoveries, what we do is we invite them to help us write up these little these notes that we publish in Herpetological Review. So all the people you see in red, so um, Reese and his dad Will, um, this is the guy who found the green anole, Bob Worrell and Glenn who found the Indo-Pacific gecko. Um, this is a guy who found the Mediterranean gecko in Orange County. Um, and this is the person who found the Mediterranean gecko in, in Ventura County. All of those people have now um, joined us and are now published in the, in the peer-reviewed literature as a result of these discoveries. So not only did they get to participate in sort of making these observations, they got to participate in that whole scientific process of going all the way to, to publishing this in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, a lot of times people who are familiar with citizen science, they look at this and they go, oh, you know, it's really cool. Um, you know, but like, you know, that's kind of what, you're sort of limited to just getting these locality records. And that's actually not true. So Glenn, that's Glenn Yoshida's uh, left hand. Um, so Glenn, I asked him, I said, look, Glenn, you know, we don't know what these geckos are doing in Southern California. So whenever you see a gecko at your house, can you document the temperature as well? To, and then post it to the Rascals Project and let me know the temperature. And so anyhow, he post this. This is um, March 6, 2014. And the second I saw this photo, I got really excited because it's March 6. And, and he writes, you know, I found this baby on the ground by my garage door. Looks like it might have been recent, born recently. The current temperature was 64. That thing wasn't, I mean, that thing wasn't born recently. It like hatched in the last week. So this is March 6, and that gecko just hatched, right? So here we are coming out of the Southern California winter, and this gecko just hatched out of an egg. And so what that means is that that gecko's mom must have laid that egg in, um, in late January, and then that egg continued incubating until probably late February, early March, and then that gecko hatched out. So here we have a so-called tropical gecko that is successfully reproducing over the course of the Southern California winter. Now, we've been in a drought. It's hard to say that there's such a thing as a Southern California winter, but still, technically, it was a winter. The temperature when we found it was 64 degrees, and this tropical gecko is just cruising around, no problem. So we're actually learning about the biology of these animals as well, all because you know somebody's out there taking photos with their smartphone. Um, this is another uh, sort of fun story. This is kind of a crazy story about how these introduced species show up. So this is a thing called the Italian wall lizard. Um, in Italy, they don't call it the Italian wall lizard. In Italy, they call it the ruin lizard. So if you go to Italy and you like walk around like Roman ruins, what you're going to find are Italian wall lizards, and they're just hanging out on these on these you know blocks of concrete, blocks of rock, and stuff like that. So this guy, um, his family was from the island of Sicily. He lives in Southern California in a town called San Pedro. He, um, he goes to Sicily and he collects four males and three females and he smuggles them back to Los Angeles in his luggage. And he gets to his house and he decides he wants to have these things in his yard. And so he builds a habitat in his backyard. He like makes a ruin, which is pretty easy. It's called you take a bunch of broken concrete and you throw it into a pile. And you release these lizards into it. And he was worried they wouldn't be able to find enough food, so he trained them to eat mealworms off of forceps. And then he was worried that there's a lot of feral cats. This is right near the port of LA. There's a lot of feral cats and raccoons. And so he was worried that they would eat the, you know, his seven precious lizards. And so he put up uh, an electric fence around his property to keep all the feral cats away. This guy is serious. Uh, so that was 1994. So you go there today, and this is the highest lizard densities you will ever see in your entire life outside of a pet store. Um, it's absolutely amazing. There are thousands of these lizards hanging out in this town called Coastal San Pedro. Um, 
And, and these lizards, I mean, they're gorgeous, right? And they like, they're, they don't do anything. They just sit there. So what happens is that the people in the neighborhood get really attached to them. Like they all have given them first names. Because every day you walk like to your mailbox and it's like there's the same bright green lizard sitting right underneath your mailbox. And you walk back and it's like there's the same lizard there and the same lizard there. And they're there every day for months on end. So they get really attached to their lizards. But what their lizards do do is they eat a ton of stuff. And they pretty much eat anything. They're pretty amazing. They're actually omnivorous, so they'll eat fruit. Um, they'll also eat insects and spiders, which are sort of generalist. They'll eat slugs. Um, they'll also eat smaller lizards. They'll eat baby birds. They'll eat um, small mammals. Just like whatever comes by, they'll eat. Um, this is their range in coastal San Pedro. This doesn't, I know this area doesn't mean a whole lot to you. This is right near the port of LA. But they're spread across this pretty big area. And it's easy. Like, they're really conspicuous lizards. As a biologist, I can just walk down there and be like, OK, there's a lizard. There's one. There's one. And so these are just all points that me and my field crew have found just walking around this area. We're just literally walking up and down sidewalks, looking very bizarre, walking around with our lizard nooses, which are just big, long fishing poles with nooses tied on the end. The neighbors all asking what the heck we're doing, sometimes getting angry at us because we're collecting some of their precious lizards. Um, but one of the things that's also going on in that neighborhood is that there's two native lizards. There's a thing called a southern alligator lizard. And this is an absolutely fantastic lizard. They get bigger than the Italian wall lizard. So a huge southern alligator lizard that's full length is about like that. It's mostly tail. Without its tail, it's about that long. And then we have this thing called the western fence lizard, which is a type of spiny lizard. Um, and, and they exist in this neighborhood as well. Now these guys bask in the sun. They actually, just like the anoles, they do these push-up displays. They have bright blue bellies. They're pretty conspicuous. But these alligator lizards don't bask. So you have to like look under vegetation for them. So they're hard to see. So um, what I wanted to know is, well, we know that there's these native lizards here. But what's their range in relation to these non-native lizards? But it was really hard for us to find the native lizards. Over the course of I mean, thousands of field hours between me and my field crew, we had seen two, southern, we'd seen two western fence lizards and one alligator lizard. That's it. So what we did was we made these flyers. And we went door to door in the neighborhood. And we just handed out these flyers, just like put them on people's doorsteps. And we said, look, if you see any reptile or amphibian in your neighborhood, but particularly these native lizards, you know, can you take a photo of them and email that photo to the museum? And, uh, and, we, and we had people doing that. And now you got to figure, like, most of these flyers ended up on someone's doorstep or in someone's mailbox, which means they were never seen. They went straight to the recycling bin. But some people did read them, and they got really into this. And they sent in a bunch of observations. And these are some of those observations. So this, this one here is actually the alligator lizard that I saw. So the red dots are alligator lizards. The blue dots are the fence lizards. And the yellow dots are the Italian wall lizards. And so what you can see is that it's basically you know, a complete donut hole out of the range of our native lizards. You get to the area where the Italian wall lizards are found, and there's no more native lizards. So we found, like there's a house here. This guy who lives in this house right here has this cat that I hate. His name's Poppy. She's really cute. Um, and what Poppy does is she runs around the yard and she kills lizards. And when she does that, the owner throws those lizards in the freezer and then emails me. And once every couple months, I go down and I take the contents of his freezer, which is like usually like six to 10 dead lizards. Um, and so uh, at his house, all we've ever, that's, that's, that's his house is like, if you walk, North from his house, you only see Italian wall lizards. If you walk south from his house, you don't see Italian wall lizards anymore. So he's a house right on the border of where those Italian wall lizards are found. And at his house, you can get southern alligator lizards. But you walk into the main range, and you almost never see that native southern alligator lizard anymore. Same thing. You look over here. There's lots of um, sightings. And this is actually this is a little bit out of date. We actually have about, I don't know, 15 of these um, fence lizard sightings now. Mostly right here. This is a big high school. Mostly right here around this high school. And as soon as you start to get into the area with the Italian wall lizards, you no longer find any more of these, um, of these fence lizards. Again, this is data that I was not able to get. Like me and my field crew were not able to get all these observations. We only were able to get these observations because they're from people's yards, right? It's Poppy the cat going in and killing these lizards, and then the homeowner keeping those lizards so that we can see them. Because these are all private property. And when you're trying to do work in these urban areas where you have to deal with the fact that everything is private property, it's really challenging to get data unless you're thinking about something like citizen science. And then you can empower people to help you collect the data you need to address questions like this you know, with an introduced species. Um, so um, 
so sort of what's the situation for, for a place like LA? Well, the bad news is that, um, you know, for these really urbanized areas, and if you're thinking even, you know, again, I wanted to make this really relevant to Louisiana, even outside of places that are really urbanized, um, you, you still have a lot of these same issues. So, but in urbanized places, on top of all the issues that, that the rest of the world has, you've also got the fact that access to land is incredibly difficult. Um, and as areas become more and more urban, urbanized, the availability for biologists to get onto those pieces of property and do surveys, of course, decreases. So the standard, in the standard approach to assessing distributions, in other words, getting museum records, um, has declined dramatically for a variety of reasons. Um, but particularly in urban areas, it's really hard to you know, get those specimens in hand and collect those specimens from a, from a particular place. And for these urban areas, we know that the biodiversity is changing rapidly, you know, in part through these introduced species. And of course, documenting these introduced species and stopping these invasions, you know, the only way you can do that is if you detect them early. You know, if those things have been on the landscape, you know, these Italian wallabies, we're not stopping them. They've been on the landscape for 20 years. There's thousands of them. We could have stopped them when they were seven. We probably could have stopped them when they were 100, but we're not going to be able to stop them now that there's thousands across, you know, multiple city blocks. Um, but we can at least detect some of these species now, you know, using citizen science. And so I think the good news, you know, whether you're thinking about trying to increase um, documenting records in a place that's not super urbanized, but especially when you're thinking about trying to document records in a place that is really urbanized, I think really citizen science provides um, you know, a really great opportunity for rapidly collecting data from these places. Um, and so I think it gives me some hope that, that we're able to, to you know, decrease detection times for non-natives and increase the number of modern day observations that we can then compare to these historical museum records and start to understand how things like urbanization and global climate change are, are impacting some of our native species. Um, I just want to point out, I focused all the time today on this Rascals project because we've, we've just been focusing so hard on that. And I think it's sort of such an interesting way to bring technology to this, to this problem, right? And fairly s simplistic technology. I mean, everybody in this room right now probably has a smartphone that's GPS enabled um, and can start doing this. And I also wanted to point out that there's tons of these projects. Not just like my project in Southern California, but there's lots of these projects. There's actually another project that I work on called Gecko Watch. And because we've been so good at detecting these, these geckos through citizen science um, in Southern California, we expanded this project to be nationwide. So we ask that um, if you're out, you know, you're in Baton Rouge, you're heading home tonight, and you walk into your apartment or your house and you see a gecko, take a photo of it and send it, um, you know, upload it to Gecko Watch. There's a, all of this is done through iNaturalist. You can download a smartphone app for iNaturalist um, and you can upload directly through that app. You can also just email uh, geckowatch at nhm.org or the email I had up there earlier, rascals at nhm.org. And better than doing it here in Baton Rouge where we know that these geckos already occur, when you go home to whatever city that is, um, if it's in Louisiana or elsewhere and you see a gecko, document that. Even here in Baton Rouge, like we know the Mediterranean house gecko is here. I can guarantee you that within the next 30 years, you'll probably have four species of geckos here. Um, so we're trying to also see for these other species of geckos. There's, there's actually 16 non-native species of geckos introduced somewhere in the United States. Um, and so we're trying to track movements of all of those. Um, and with that, I'll just end. Uh, it's, you know, when you work on these citizen science projects, one of the things that's really, really complicated is getting the word out. How do you just get the word out to hundreds of people? You know, we got 18.4 million people in the greater LA area. How do you get the word out? Well, the best way is you have a bunch of really good partners. And so these are a whole bunch of partners that have really helped us. And then at the museum, um, I'm really lucky that we have a fantastic um, group in our citizen science office that really helps me promote these projects. And so um, Leela Higgins and Richard Smart and Miguel Ordinania have been super helpful um, in all of these projects. And I think with that, we've got, I'm a minute early. So I think we've got time for questions, if that's the usual format. So all these uh, talks are recorded, uh, to put on YouTube later on, and archived, and they're also broadcast online. So for future viewers of this talk who want to participate in this Q&A, we're going to walk around with some microphones. So if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand, and we'll bring a mic by, and then you can ask it so we can keep track. I'll kick things <laughs> off. <laughs> um, so the data from this seems like it would be really interesting for a lot of uh, a lot of different kinds of questions. Um, is that publicly available? Like oh, other, thank you, yeah. researchers access that? Yeah, so um, that brings up actually two sort of really interesting points. First of all, in general, yes. So um, iNaturalist, uh, anybody here can go to iNaturalist and can download 
records. There's about almost two million records now on iNaturalist. They're global in scope. Um, and you can, for any question, you know, whatever, whatever species you're interested in, you can go download records. Now, the caveat to that is that, um, let's say that somebody is at their favorite spot for looking for a particular snake. And they're happy to upload those records, but they don't want to let people know their favorite spot. So they can do what's called obscuring it. So then what happens is when you were to look at it, it's within this sort of, there's a 10 kilometer bubble put around the actual locality and the, the point is placed somewhere in that bubble. And the main reason that that's done is not to hide people's favorite spots. The main reason that that's done is let's say that it's something of some conservation concern. Every species that is uh, federally or state listed, at least for the US, and then every species that's, um, that's on the red list, all of those are automatically obscured. And the reason for that is so that poachers um, of any form, and whether that's a 13-year-old kid who's just really into that snake, or whether that's a professional poacher who makes their living off of selling you know, wildlife on the black market, it's so that these records aren't available to people like that who are going to be doing things to, you know, unethically. Um, so if that's the case, then what you have to do is you have to contact whoever's in charge of the project. And I get emails about this occasionally. Hey, you know, I'm a graduate student at such and such a place. I'm working on this species. I see you have a, you know, a dozen records and rascals. Can you send me the locality data for those? And then, uh, then we can do it if it's a, if it's a, you know, if there's a legitimate need. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in general, you know, for most species that aren't of conservation concern, people can, anybody can go and download those records and use them for analysis. That's great. Yeah. Questions? You're making it easy on me. Yeah. Nice. I'll make it w a little bit harder okay. one more time. So you talked uh, about several stories related to um, finding new invasive species. Were there any native species that you expect, you know, to respond negatively to urbanization, but you don't expect to find in LA now that you have found? Yeah. So um, I wish that there were some really happy stories to end on there, and there's not. Uh, now, the there are some species that have responded really, really negatively to urbanization, and we are recording them through the project. The most the most obvious one is this thing called the um, the coast horn lizard is a species that, I mean, it's actually a little bit of a Louisiana story in some ways. I mean, Louisiana has been really impacted by um, the in fire ant invasion, right? So fire ants have had huge impacts on native reptiles and amphibians. And we have a similar situation in California. We have a thing called the Argentine ant. And the Argentine ant is not as bad as the fire ant in terms of having a painful bite. But what the Argentine ant does is it displaces native ants. Horn lizards, about 95% of their diet is native ants. And if these Argentine ants move in, kick out all the native ants, Horn lizards won't eat Argentine ants, and so, so horn lizards are basically gone from most of the LA area. Whereas in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, the horn lizard was the backyard lizard for most people in places like Pasadena. Um, anyone that, that bordered the, the San Gabriel Mountains, that was the common lizard. And now they're gone. And we're, we're not finding that, even with the citizen science, we're not finding that there's little pockets of them left in urban parts of LA. But we are recording them out just immediately outside of that. So we at least can say that, you know, well, it's confirming what we already knew. You know, we, we were pretty sure that they weren't making it in any urban areas, and that's exactly what we're seeing with the citizen science group. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the big things that I'm trying to get at is, so, so long term, like what are, the, what are the applications of this? So obviously there's the application of like, we're trying to lower the detection time for these non-native species, and we're absolutely doing that. But the other thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how these species are responding to urbanization. But the reason for doing that is so we can then take that information, so we can understand like, okay, you know, for alligator lizards, they're making it in these types of neighborhoods. So what are the correlates of where they occur? Is it that they're in neighborhoods that are within 100 meters of a creek? Is it that we're there within neighborhoods that have, um, you know, a certain percent of hardscape, you know, a low level of hardscape? Is it that they're in neighborhoods that are over, say, 50 years old, right? What are these correlates of where they occur? And then if it's a species that we're particularly concerned about, we can start thinking about trying to modify the, the landscape and future development to, to not be so negatively impacting those species. So in the long run, the goal is not just that this is about you know, understanding how these species are responding, but it's understanding that so that we can impact long-term urban planning to actually be more welcoming to our native biodiversity. Um, and I think you know, when, you, when you come back to the beginning of this talk with 7.4 billion people and counting on this planet, I think we need to start thinking more about how in urban areas we can, we can manage for our native biodiversity in much more strategic ways. And so in the long run, hopefully this project is going to be able to help us to do that.
I was just wondering, what is what is the why why do we have decreasing number of these museum specimens? Is it going to be blamed PETA for that, or what's the? <laughs> Um, so the, yeah, so the question is why do we have this decreasing number of museum specimens? And um, there's a bunch of reasons for that. The, um, the main reason is that there's a lot less funding for straight natural history research. And so while a lot of natural history research was occurring in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s, um, the funding for that has declined as funding has been directed towards you know, diversity of, of other projects, right? And in some ways, you know, that's great, right? Science is you know, it's not like people were doing, um, you know, next generation sequencing in the 1960s and 70s. So there's a lot, you know, if you just think about the diversity of sort of scientific research that was going on, that's really expanded over the last, you know, well, whatever, it's been expanding for, you know, thousands of years. But particularly in the last 50 years, we see that the funding streams have just become more diversified. So in some ways that's positive, but the amount of money going towards straight natural history research has declined. And because of that, the number of specimens going into museums has declined. Um, another reason is that permits have become... Uh, much more challenging to get. And in some ways, that's good, right? I mean, you want there to be some level of oversight onto what people are going out and collecting. But in some cases, the, the sort of level of red tape has become so challenging that a lot of people have just sort of given up on getting those permits. And so maybe if you're working on, you know, it used to be that if you were working on Species X, maybe at your field sites, you also, you know, you take, you collect two individuals of everything else out there as vouchers for that locality at that particular time. And now people just aren't doing that. They're just like the absolute minimum, they get that, and they move on. And so we're losing a lot of this really valuable record that, you know, unfortunately has, have, having, you know, if we had those museum specimens, they could potentially have huge impacts on some of the conservation work that we're doing now. And lacking them, you know, we've, we've really lost a lot of information. Um, I think the good news is that, A, the citizen science is working. And the other thing is actually I use the citizen science a lot for recruiting um, amateurs who can start to contribute to museum records. And so what I do is, like, the people that are re really into this, I contact them. I say, hey, look, you know, I saw you just took, you know, you just submitted photographs of three road-killed snakes. Um, if I put you on my scientific collecting permit, will you start picking up those snakes and then, like, once a year bring them to me at the museum and we'll preserve them and put them in the collection? And we're now doing that and we're getting, um, like, two to 400 specimens a year just from people picking up roadkills for us. Now, it means we're getting a very biased sample, right? We're not getting salamanders. We're not getting very many frogs. We get some frogs. We're not getting very many lizards. We're mostly getting snakes, but better than nothing, right? So it is actually, it's been a tool for recruiting, like, dedicated, you know, hardcore folks for, for coming out and helping to build up specimens. Okay, with that, just two quick reminders. If you haven't signed in, please do so when you leave. Um, and there should hopefully be pizza outside, but if there's not, it will be here shortly. So just hang out. But before you leave, let's thank uh, Dr. Polly one more time. <laughs>